So um, this is actually three sessions all rolled into one. And fortunately, I'm the person standing between you and beer. So <laughs> uh, seriously, I've baked as much time in. To, I, I want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, I've got about 40 different um, code snippets that we're going to go through. Uh, I put them all up on, has anybody been looking at the, the blog? Um, like I did this presentation last year in uh, Vegas and I, I was doing it for this year and in January, like an idiot, <laughs> I said, I'm going to tear everything apart and do it all over again, right? So since January, I've been building a little repository out on our box account. So there's like 13 hours of video, there's about 70 code examples, and then everything that we're going to talk about here, the presentation, all the code, uh, there's also a, uh, a VM up there that I'm going to be working from. So you are more than welcome to pull that down now and follow along. Um, again, make this as interactive as possible. Um, uh, if you just sit there and don't ask questions, if we don't start, you know, kind of monkeying around with this ourselves, we're going to waste everybody's time. So, everybody good? Does anybody want to actually participate? Everybody, anyone got um, like Python installed or VirtualBox? Any VirtualBox people? Uh, go get the OVA. It took, yeah. Sorry? So, uh, I'm using just VirtualBox. Uh, yeah. Uh, and literally, the last version of it I did just before coming here. <laughs> so so uh, this is kind of last minute. All right, so let's start out with really super complex code, some Python code. If you look at it, uh, the point of this, the point of this entire thing is not to make you all network engineers, or, or I'm sorry, network programmers, but to just give you a sense of how powerful and how much stuff comes out of the box with Python. It's, it's unbelievable how much stuff goes on. And that's what we're going to go through. Again, this is kind of an introductory course. It's not really um, all the code snippets. Uh, I'll kind of remind you, all the code snippets, no error correction. I, I kind of favored, I went on the side of uh, getting it out the door. So there's no error correction. There's no, uh, let me ask this question. Let me step back. Any programmers here? Good. Oh, <laughs> you got to leave. So this code is not elegant. It's not bulletproof. It's not streamlined. A person who gets paid to do this, to, to write the code, would roll their eyes at the sloppy stuff that's going to be put up. But that's kind of the point for, uh, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, from a, a purely uh, programmatic, programmatic perspective. Uh, Python is an object-oriented language. It's extremely powerful. But for our needs as network engineers, it, it really, we really don't have to understand, in my opinion, all the object-oriented stuff that goes along with that, right? We can code it as a, what's called a procedural-oriented program, right? For our perspective, from our perspective, what I would think we would use this for are quick hits, you know, get in there if there's a fire, if you got to look at something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's kick off this first code. And the reason I want to bring this up, it just brings up a browser and it takes us to, you know, if this ever comes up, it takes us to the repository I was talking about. So, um, and again, if you go to this repository, this uh, URL, all the listings, everything are up there. So <clears throat> all this stuff, part one, part two, and part three, that's all the videos on the, the Python language, right? Like the background, you know, syntactical stuff uh, with code listings, the language fundamentals, how it's different than, say, Java, you know, or, or C or whatever. This is what we're going to talk about today in this dictionary, in this, uh, sorry, folder. So let's go there. 
So in this folder, uh, there's this presentation that I'm doing. Uh, we have the OVA, <coughs> excuse me, the Ubuntu OVA. I downloaded it from virtual boxes. Uh, all the passwords are vagrant. The usernames are vagrant and vagrant, right? Uh, I did, we're going to talk about security at one point during this session. So uh, we did some uh, certs, some SSL certs, and we just did self-signed certs. All the passwords that went into those, all the construction of those, it's all vagrant. So everything um, that we're going to talk about, password is vagrant, usernames are vagrant, uh, there is a Cisco account out there. Uh, that password is Cisco. Uh, and there's really nothing on there. But you're more than welcome to, to tear it down. I'm hoping you actually pull it down now uh, and start uh, following along. If you don't want to do that, if you don't want to use the virtual box, all the code is in what we're going to talk about now is in part one, part two, and part three of these sessions, right? So, and again, what, you know, the biggest point about this is we want you to walk away from this with a bunch of stuff that you can refer back to. It's not you have to scarf it all up today. But um, so what we did was there's another directory in here called listing by topic. And that's all of the um, folders around the topics that we're going to talk about today, except for this one. This is, um, this is an encryption background, but we're going to talk about files, we're going to talk about UDP, we're going to talk about TCP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let me give you a, we're going to spend a lot of time on TCP. These are the, this is just an example of the listings. So if you don't want to follow along, if you don't want to download the, the OVA, uh, pull the code down, pull the source. You don't have to run it, you can just look at it, right? If, um, if I'm going too fast or I'm going too slow, please stop me, you know, give me the high sign. Okay. Before we begin, any questions? So um, part of this is me trying to figure out, you know, there's a big crowd here, where you guys are with the language. So just to show of hands, how familiar are you with, um, you know, Python, the Python language? Like, see a show of hands for, yeah, I kind of know how to spell it. I, yeah. See so a show of hands for, I'm pretty good with it. I messed around with it. Okay. See so a show of hands for, Vince, I should be teaching this class. Good. That's a good thing. That's a good sign. All right. So let's jump in. Any, any uh, specific questions that you guys wanted to find out today? Anything you're looking for? Okay, good interactive dialogue. So, let's, um, now we're not gonna, we're certainly not going to be able to finish everything that we have today. I mean, we would be here for a year. This is like probably eight hours worth of stuff in less than three hours, right? So, again, the purpose of this is for you guys to walk away with kind of this repository, something you can go back to Look at some videos, pull the code down, look at the, the presentations. Yes? Sorry? Absolutely. Absolutely. You are going to get a prize if you get this running. Okay? Um, if, by the way, if you guys just want the repository, this little program is sitting out in this URL. Okay, so I, again, I strongly encourage you, don't just sit there. <clears throat> Do you get it? You good? Good. Okay. All right, so talk about that. So here's what we're going to talk about today, as much time as possible. Talk about the basics of Python. We're going to talk about uh, the, probably the fundamental guts, the fundamental guts of all communications. I mean, we run around, you know, quibbling and worrying about, you know, OSPF, SPF timers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
but the guts that hangs everything off it, from a web browser to, you know, an RPC server to an APIC interface to an APIC EM interface, all revolves around something called a, a socket. We'll talk about what a socket is. Um, we'll also get into security. And again, the listings, will, uh, you know, we'll actually do some of the um, SSL connections. We'll do a hashing, some hashing functions, et cetera. We'll talk about the quote unquote higher level protocols. Um, we'll talk about something called XML RPC, which by the way, is the exact same mechanism that uh, APIC, anybody familiar with ACI? So ACI sends policy from the, the controller down to the leaf. The mechanism that that happens through is XML RPC, right? So, and that's why we can have, that's why a leaf can essentially act independently, you know, from a, a you know, a, a policy controller. And that doesn't matter, it's not just ACI, right? Okay, we'll talk about REST. Anybody ever hear of screen scraping? Screen scraping? Sounds kind of nasty, but um, we'll do a little bit of, of that to give you a taste for it. And then we'll, you know, kind of finish up. Now again, I've tried to bake in as much time um, just so you guys can, uh, you know, fool around with this stuff and start asking questions. Is this good? Anything you guys wanted to see in particular? All right, let's jump in. So um, you start up Python, uh, what happens? Any program, forget just Python. You start up a program, it builds this area in memory, uh, and it builds all these tables and structures and all this goofy stuff. Um, and part of that, when you start up, when you start a program up, you give it the program name and you give it any parameters that you want that program to ingest and use, right? Maybe an IP address or, or whatever, right? So when that program is getting initialized by the operating system, when it's being brought up, right? There is this little area that gets set aside for command line arguments. Right, so if a ping, for example, when I say ping, that's a program. And it, you know, you put an IP address of where you want to go to or a fully qualified domain name. That's a command line argument, right? So we're going to talk about how you pull stuff in, how you manipulate it, what it is. Because it is kind of an important uh, concept because most programs usually have some kind of, you know, startup requirement, some command line uh, requirement, right? We'll talk about uh, working with files and directories. Again, I didn't know what you guys, you know, what kind of background you had. So I'm going to start off kind of slow and then accelerate. Um, we'll talk about some of the more powerful aspects of uh, some of the Python modules that you get. One's called the OS module. Basically gives you access to the, you know, the operating system, whatever operating system it is. So. Then we'll talk about, again, the guts of any programming language. What hangs, what, what you know, gives us all jobs. And that is, that's a concept called sockets, right? And we'll talk about, within sockets, we'll talk about, you know, what, what exactly do I have to do programmatically to access the socket? What can I just do, what can I get from my machine just by you know, uh, starting Python and doing a couple quick queries, right? We'll look at that. We'll look at, um, we'll look at the UDP. We'll set up a little, you know, cheap, El Cheapo um, client server UDP broadcast device. If any of you guys have the code, we may be able to get some messages bouncing back and forth. I mean, if you want to, again, if you want to run it. We'll talk about, you know, what is a socket uh, we'll very briefly talk about object-oriented programming. We'll talk about five decisions that have to be made when you want to establish a connection programmatically between a server and a client. You've got to make five decisions, basically five decisions, right? Uh, we'll talk about socket objects and socket names, right? Then we'll move into, we'll move up the stack a little bit, and we'll start talking about TCP, right? TCP IP. Um, we'll talk about, 
you know, along with, you know, networking stuff, you really, you know, working with files and directories and the system and all that kind of stuff, it goes hand in hand. So you kind of have to know one to know the other, right? So what we're going to talk about are how you parse through directories and how you list out files, uh, you know, just how you access that kind of stuff, because that's what's going to go into a lot of what we do in the examples. Then uh, we'll jump into just a simple El Cheapo TCP client server connection, right? What is anybody, what, what's UDP? What's the, the salient difference between UDP and TCP? Good answer. What? <laughs> what's that? Reliable, Connect connection oriented. TCP. Absolutely right. Connection oriented versus broadcast, right? We hate broadcasts as network people, right? We've worked for years to get rid of them. So connection oriented, trade off being very long time to set up a TCP connection, takes a lot of, of resources versus a UDP connection, quick hit, packets go out. If you get them, if you get them, you don't, you don't, right? So we'll look at that. Then we'll kind of translate that, we'll step up our game a little bit, and we'll uh, do a simple TCP file transfer, right? We'll just send a, a request to a server, he'll send us back a file, we'll do some stuff with it. Then we'll step up our game even more. We'll not only, when we do that file, right, with a client to that server, and the server sends it back, well, the server's got to know where that file is, right? So we'll do a little directory search, right? That, so that file can be anywhere on that server. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Then we'll talk about security, right? The uh, big question that we want to get resolved today is, is anybody messing with my stuff, right? Um, we want to be able to generate hashes. We want to be able to understand when a file was opened, when it was modified, when it was changed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll look at the various hashing algorithms. You guys know this better than I do, I guarantee it. I mean, uh, we'll look at those. We'll look at um, how to generate a, a one-way hash, very simple. Then we'll, we'll talk about, we set up a little demonstration system that lets us just, you know, the client asks the server, hey, go give me a hash for this file. The file comes back, or the, the hash comes back to the client. He saves it, and he make, makes another request, and if that file is changed, those hashes won't be, evil, won't be even, right? So, um, and then we'll, we'll totally step up our game by talking about an SSL connection. And that uh, revolves around the concept of socket wrapping, something called socket wrapping. Is that all right? And then we'll get into, uh, if we still have time, we'll get into XML RPC. Uh, but before we do that, we want to do something interesting with that. So what we'll do is we'll have a little primer on how to build a spreadsheet with Python. Uh, again, the listings are out there. It's in a directory called spreadsheets if you, if you want to use them. And once we're done with that, we'll actually do kind of remote job execution um, using a client server and some spreadsheet stuff. Then we'll talk about, uh, you know, kind of a Q&A interactive session around REST. You hear a lot about REST. What is it? What's it useful for? That kind of stuff. We'll talk about screen scraping. We, we mentioned that already. And then, uh, unfortunately, we don't have an APIC here, but uh, we have some example code on uh, there are multiple ways to access our controllers, right? You can either go out and get a, you know, an SDK, download a, a software development kit that has special APIs that allow you to manipulate a controller, right? Or you can just use REST, right? And I'll give you an example of that. What we do is we give you multiple options. One is like this hardcore SDK. One is like an, something called the ACI Toolkit with ACI. It uh, comes with a lot of stuff. And then finally, we, we give you kind of this northbound RESTful interface that you can manipulate stuff. So we can go through that code. Is, that, is this OK? What do you guys think? 
Thumbs up. Down. No tomatoes. Okay? Leave them at home. <laughs> so, what is the point of all this, this stuff, right? We talk about Python. It's, very, it's, it's actually a very simple language. So what's the point? Well, the point is, do not reinvent the wheel. I mean, uh, Python is extremely, extremely powerful. I will guarantee you, if there's something that you've thought about that, hey, wouldn't it be cool to code it? It's already out there. It's in a general repository or repositories. The central repository for Python is called PyPy. Uh, and it's extremely simple to download, integrate into your software, into your, um, your language. Uh, and it's, in fact, 90% of what we're going to talk about was stuff that I stole from, you know, the web, from other sites, you know. And again, this is the old axiom, good programmers, you know, kind of write code, great programmers steal it. That is a, that's an absolute fact. You are burning cycles if you're trying to, you know, build your own little uh, specialized routines. Okay. So let's jump in. Uh, first off, is that okay with everybody? All right, let's jump in. So let's talk about some of the basics. We'll talk about the command line first, then some uh, files. This is what we talked about. When you go to start up Python or any program, really, this is the, this is the interpreter. The Python interpreter. Actually, I actually have this pointer. This is actually the interpreter, the program that takes in your source code, you know, jumbles it around, looks at it, makes sure it's OK, and then turns it into machine executable code, right? This is usually the, your program name. Well, it's always your program name, right? Followed by uh, you know, whatever parameters you want to accompany that program when it gets loaded, that script when it gets loaded. So these uh, are the things, these elements are the things that I was talking about that go into this special area, this and this, go into a special area called argv, argv. Does anybody know anything about Python lists? It's, it's, they're unbelievably easy to use. Uh, once you get into it, it'll be probably be the first thing you learn. Was that a question? Okay. Probably the first thing you'll, you'll learn is about lists. All argv is, a, is, is it's a system level list that collects all the junk that you have on the command line when you execute a program, right? So what it looks like is this, literally. Uh, the name argv and then brackets and then the program name is first, usually in the first position. And then any additional command line arguments that you want to add into that, right? So this is argv offset zero, the first place in that list, right? Or subscript zero, however you want to call it. Uh, this is argv offset one. Right? And then this is offset two. So now I, I know where this area is, this system area is. I know how to access the individual elements on there. So I can do things like I can count how many parameters have been added on the command line when I pulled it in. Right? I can uh, add parameters. If a program starts up and I think there should be an additional, maybe there should be you know, some additional command line argument, I can force that into that area. This makes sense? You guys not asleep yet? Let's look at our first, uh, our first listing. Let's try to take a drink here. So it's called follow all the program listings, by the way. Start with the word follow, because that's the intent of this session for you guys to follow along. So, is that a question? Good, okay. So, um, follow CMD, yes. Sorry? Which directory should I need to download to execute these codes? 
So go to part one that has all the stuff we're going to talk about in you know, part one, all the UDP stuff, all the, this stuff. And I'll show you that in one minute. You okay? You want to get videos? Yeah. Here, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Let's just go live. Uh, see, we need to go to DevNet Sessions. This is good. We need to go here. There's either part one, part two, and part three. And then just the general listings by topic are there. Okay? So part one is where we are right now. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, so um, let's just go into the code. Uh, I'm going to use the, as much as possible, I'll use the uh, OVA that I have put up there so you guys can, you know where everything is, right? So, password is vagrant. So here's all the stuff. Let me, uh, is anybody kind of a Linux kind of person? Comfortable with it? Uncomfortable? Good. Seems like a lot of uncomfortable people here. Good? Okay. So let's do this. Let's just bring up a command line. So from the home directory, if we do an ls, we'll see all the directories that are out there, right? Um, and what I'm doing through the Ubuntu, they've got a, like a, a dir function, like Windows has a, a graphical interface that shows you the files. So I'm just kind of poking around. I'm in home. And these are all the, you know, this is what we're going to talk about now, part one, two, and three. But in addition, you know, these are the listings. FTP has a bunch of files. Hashing has a bunch of files, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's go to part one. And these are, this is the program set that we're going to talk about now. So I've installed on the OVA uh, Python. But again, feel free to pull it down and run it on your own version of Python if you want. Okay? So let's start up Python. And I'm going to open... Uh, let me go to part one. <clears throat> I'll get uh, follow command line. Everybody see where I am? All right, so this is our first listing. Please let me know if you get it, or this is totally boring, or you want to see more, or you want to see less, whatever. Uh, because we're just going to keep building on this. It's about the simplest uh, version that we have. So what we're doing first is um, we're going to import, we use an import statement to pull in any of these modules that come with Python. Remember I talked about some of the modules that we'll be using, like spreadsheets and what have you. You pull them down from the repository. Uh, it's, again, it's called PyPy. You, you use this utility called pip. Pull it down from lots of P's there. You pull it down from the repository, and then you import the module that you, uh, you want to use using an import statement. So here we're importing sys. We're doing some fancy printing here. We're just saying, hey, print 77 uh, equal signs. Doing some more fancy stuff, showing some um, you know, tabbing and new lines and all that kind of stuff. Here's where it gets interesting. So here is. That special area that we talked about, sys, right, that we loaded up here, and argv is that special buffer that has the command lines. So if you'll notice, this is wrapped around a tool, uh, a method, or a, um, a utility in Python called len. And all len does is count up how many things are there. Anything inside these parentheses Python is going to put that number in this variable that I just, I just arbitrarily call it argnums. But you get that? So, on down. And here is our first kind of if statement. So, we're saying if we've already got the number of things on that command line, and we're saying that if that number is greater than one, then we, hey, we know we've got parameters that they keyed in on the command line. 
Everybody get this? Good? So if it's greater than one, we say, hey, I'm just going to print out this thing. The first parameter on the command line is, you know, whatever that offset zero is. If not, if it's, if it's not greater than one, it means there's no command lines, right? So I'm saying there's nothing other than the program name. Okay? So let's go on down here. Then we do some fancy stuff. So in our case, what we're going to do is we're going to launch Python. We're going to launch this script. And we're not going to have any command line arguments on it, right? But we're going to sneakily go in and pop two strings into that area. One is called hello, and one is called world. So this is that special area. We're going to append these strings into them. So what we'll end up with is a, uh, you know, a, a program that gets executed with new command line arguments, right? Everybody see that? You guys good? Good? All right. Then we just, this is nothing more than just fancy printing, right? All we're doing is what we talked about earlier. We take, you know, the number of arguments. We're taking the first one that we find, offset zero. We're taking the, you know, the next one and then the next one, and we're just printing them out in a fancy sort of way. Doing some more fancy thing. And then one thing that you'll see all the time in really any language is something called type casting. So, um, and I'm, I don't know the audience here, so I'm not trying to be condescending, but does everybody know what a variable is? So a variable, yeah, it's just a container of some kind. But you have to have a type associated with that variable, right? So if it's a number, it's got to be an integer or, you know, a, you know, a fraction or something. If it's a string, like hello world, that's a different type. So what Python lets you do is do something called type casting. And that's where, let's say I have an integer. Now, we're going to see this all the time in this networking stuff, so this is important. I have a string, let's say, and the string is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I can type cast that as an integer. Right? If I have that string, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I can't add a number to it because it's, a, it's basically a printable character. So I have to convert it into an integer that I can do addition on. Right? That's called typecasting, and that happens all the time. Right? Everybody see that? Good. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to show here, we're going to enter a number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it'll be a string. And then what we'll do is we'll typecast it as an integer so that we can do addition on it. OK? Let's run that bad boy. So here's what we get when we run the program. Uh, we said here's this program's command line is a list that contains, here's all the stuff that got pulled in and put in that system area, right? Uh, it, it counted up. Remember, we talked about len. Len went in and said, oh, there's only one uh, element on that, on that command line, right? Uh, it's saying, hey, there's nothing else on the command line. This is where we add those, we sneakily add those two strings onto it. We do the whole thing again and we say, now this time there's three, right? We say, you know, we print out what it is and then we do our, uh, it's waiting for us to do our typecasting here. So. Let's do one, two, three, four, five. This is normally a string, but again, we typecasted it and we forced it to be an integer. So that is our first program listing done. So let me ask you, too fast, too slow? Do you wanna, is this okay? Okay. This is the interactive part. Let's interact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's jump back to this. Uh, and again, the, the purpose of this is for you to take this home and look at it, you know, digest it a little later. So I just did some screenshots where I could, where I had the time. Uh, so it's, this is the exact same thing we just talked about. All right, so let's look at our second listing, moving up in the world. So let's, um, 
It's called Follow Files. And let me just bring it up. And go to the virtual machine. I'm going to shut this down. Uh, let me just open. What was it called? Follow File? That's info. Follow Files. Okay, in this program, we're going to import the very powerful operating system module, OS, the OS module. And with that, you can traverse directories, you can delete files, you can make directories, you can change directories, on and on and on. This, I went out of my way <laughs> to make as confusing as possible, right? If you get this, you'll pretty much have it down, right? So I, I jumbled it all together to make it more complex Real programmers have to leave the room, like right now. <laughs> so um, let's, let's go to the bottom. Python, like any interpreted language, goes from the top down, right? What happens is you, you create these text statements. And you can really create them any way you want, on a notepad, on a, uh, you know, a fancy you know, editor, whatever. You create a source file, and it sucks in those statements. The Python program, the interpreter, sucks in those statements and looks at every single line in real time. And what the interpreter will do is it'll pull that, that thing apart and translate it into something called an object file. And that object file essentially gets bound into what runs on the operating system. Now contrast that to what happens to a, a, like a quote unquote compiled language. In a compiled language you feed the statements, you start out with source file, you feed those statements into a compiler, the compiler does all the stuff, all the syntactic checking, all that stuff, and generates an executable file. With Python and interpreted languages, it's happening in real time. That is why, for a lot of these programs, when we run them, they're going to blow up. Because it did no error checking, you know, there's no uh, protection, no nothing. So if anything goes wrong, Python just barfs on it. It just throws it on the floor. Right? That's the downside to an interpreted language. Now, that being said, you can compile. Python has the ability to compile or create executable files. Right? But that's, that's for another topic. Let's see if I ever get asked to come back here again. <laughs> All right. So, let's, so, again, we start at the top. It starts ingesting these statements. And it's not going to do anything until it gets to the very bottom, usually, you know, the bottom. It's going to start executing around here. And what you'll see is this is the most common thing you're going to see in network programming, is a, an infinite loop. What we're saying is, while true, you know, which is always the fact, do all this stuff. And what we do within this stuff, this block of code, this code block, is we say, we do all the stuff we want to do, and then we go ask the user, hey, do you want to continue collecting IP addresses? Yes or no? If they enter no, we just break out of this. We drop and we die. It, it ends the program, right? So within this, this is where I, I uh, like started mashing everything together. Again, if you get this, you'll be well on your way to understanding you know, the language itself. So we're going to execute a routine called get input and we're going to pass it these strings get input with this string get input with this string get input with this string and when each time that gets executed it's going to do something with that string and it's going to return it in here first time whatever this thing does whatever it's going to return something and it's going to be put in address next time it's going to take this as input and it's going to put it in the output into user Password, password, on and on and on. Then, at the very end, what we're going to do is we're going to take address, and we're going to concatenate that with a space, another you know, user, a space, password, and a new line character. Everybody see that? Good. OK. So let's look at the individual routines. Let's look at this um, infamous get input. What are we doing there? So, here it is. All we're doing is, when we execute, when we say, get input, that's, this is called a function. This is very common. 
when we say, you know, get input, and here's the message that I'm sending to this function, it's going to do a whole bunch of stuff, right? It's going to take the message that we sent in, and it's going to concatenate that with a string called enter. It's going to put that in this variable. Then it's going to, you know, send that out to the user. It's going to say, uh, enter whatever the message is we passed in, and it's going to return that, whatever that user entered. Does everybody see that? Everybody excited about that? I can feel the electricity. All right, so, so let's talk about, you know, the other routine that we have in here is create output. So with uh, create output, all we're doing is we're using one of the very powerful functions of uh, Python, the operating system module. If you look at this here, this is the operating system module method. It's called a method or a function called CWD, or Get Current Working Directory. So what Python is going to do is it's going to go out. When I say this, it's going to go out and it's going to find what the default directory is that it's sitting on. And it's going to plug that in to, I can look at this. It's going to plug that into the root, what I'm calling a variable called root directory. Then we're going to do, uh, we're just going to ask you to enter a file name, right? We're going to put that in file name. Then we're going to have a kind of a little decision tree. We're going to say, uh, let's say this guy, he's going to say enter a new directory or just enter to continue. Let's say he just hits enter. That means nothing gets put in here, which means it's empty. Empty is in any language. Empty is false. It means false. You know, like uh, it's a null or non, right? So we come down here. Let's say he just hit enter. That would mean if he hit enter, there's nothing in here. But if he entered something, if he gave us something, right, and we, are, we have it in this uh, variable, it means that this is going to be true. It's going to evaluate to true because there's something in it. If there was nothing in it, this would be false. So because it's true, we're going to execute this. If it was false, we wouldn't do it. We, instead, we would do this. Everybody see that? So here's another powerful uh, aspect of the operating system module. And that's where we take the directory that we're at and the file name that we want, and we combine them into a single kind of uh, string, if you will. Right? We call it path. Then we just say, once we're all done this, we open a file. You know, the, whatever we built in here, either you know, a, a directory with a, a file name that we gave it, or just a default file.txt, right? That's what the path is going to contain. We're going to open whatever is in there for appending. We're going to create something called a file pointer. Don't worry about that. We're going to write the output that we've been creating, right? And then we're going to close the file. Everybody get that? All the stuff we just talked about, with the exception of the, like the hardcore networking stuff, that's, that's it. It's going to be variations of what we just talked about here. Right? It's going to, okay, halfway? Wow. <laughs> okay. So let's run this. So let's just, I, I just made this, let's make up an IP address. Anyone want to contribute? IP? No IP address? 1.1.1.1. One dot one dot one dot one. All right, let's say Vince. Password is password. Uh, and what we're saying is, now we're asking, um, I'm, gonna, I'm about to write this IP address and name that you gave me to disk. And here's what I saw using the OS, you know, get current working directory. Here's what I saw as the current default directory that you're sitting in. So do you want to enter something else or do you just want to use this? So I'm just going to hit enter and let it plug that value for me. Then it's, then it's going to say, hey, do you want me to save this in a file, you know, a default file called file.txt, or do you want to enter a file name? So I'm just going to hit enter and let it save it. So now we should have a file sitting out in that directory containing our stuff. So let's see if it's out there first. There it is. File.txt. Let's open it. 
There you go. Voila. Nobody's too excited. All right. Does everybody see what we're doing? Any questions? So let's, let's con just do another loop. We're in this infinite loop. We're going to add another one. Two dot two dot two dot two. Uh, you know, I don't know. John. And we'll say uh, password. Okay. We'll do the default. We'll do the default. And we'll say no. We'll end it. Now, it's, it, while we were doing that, it was in that while loop. We said no. It executed that break statement. And we dropped out, and the program ended. Okay? Let's look at the file, see if it added. And there you go. There's our second entry. Everybody get this? What do you guys think? All right, so that's that. Uh, you can look at this later. Let's look at this. Let's, uh, let's get some file, inf some raw file information. It's called file info. What we'll do is we'll open up, file open. Uh, what's it? Where is file info? File info. He's come in handy. <laughs> All right, so here, what we're going to do is we're going we're to pull in two modules. One is a time module, and the other one is an operating system module. And it looks kind of funky, but you get used to this very, very quickly, right? Um, we're going to pull it in. We're going to execute uh, against a file name, and we're going to pull in some, some statistics about the file. Let's just run it. What we're going to say, um, uh, I think I am on, yeah, okay, so let's do C on users v kelly dot python 27 uh, hamlet dot text. And there it went out, it went into that directory, it queried that file, the directory entry for that file, and it came back with, okay, that's the size of the file. Now let's look at some stuff that comes in addition to getting that information about that file. It's a timestamp. So what can you do with this timestamp? Well, you can translate that into very critical to know information when the file was created, when it was accessed, and when it was modified. This is the way that you know if somebody's been tampering, one of the ways that you know if somebody's been tampering with a file. You go in, you know, depending on your, what you're looking for, you go in, you look at maybe, has anybody touched it today? Right, we get today's date, we get the modified, the last modified date, and if they're equal, you know, something's changed. You know, the access date, you know, that kind of stuff. Everybody see that? What do you guys think? Is this not the most exciting thing you have ever participated in? Ever? <laughs> All right, let's move along. Uh, let's do some crypto. Huh? You guys were bored. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take a program. It's called Follow Encrypt. Very imaginative name. We're going to. Uh, anybody know what? ROT13 is. ROT13. ROT13. It used to be called the Caesar cipher. What, what Caesar used to do before he went to war was he used to get his orders, his battle orders, and he would, uh, he'd write them down, and instead of writing them down in Latin or whatever, he would take each letter and sh in the, the alphabet and shift it to the right three, three places. So an A would be A, B, C, on and on and on. And they would just reverse it the other way. Well, some super imaginative, innovative person came up and said, well, let's shift it 13 places, right? And hence, it's called ROT13, rotate 13 places. So you take the alphabet, 
You start here. If it's an A, you count down 13. You take that letter on and on and on. You, you, wrap, you keep wrapping it around, right? So let's look at one of the things that Python gives you is this ability to, uh, by the way, that, that is the worst encryption. It's not even encryption. It's encoding. It's, it, don't ever use it. It's very easy to use, but don't ever rely on it. Maybe if you want to hide the Christmas shopping list from the kids, you know, something like that, uh, but don't ever use it. Here, let's, let's just fire it up. All right, so let's bring this up. Bring it up with Python. Let me open my files. Let me go to part one. Let me go to uh, encrypt. And here we go. There's really not a lot to this, right? All we're doing is we're going to take something from the, just like we did before, we're going to take something from the console, the user, um, and we're going to run, you know, we're going to do the whole searching thing through the directory, all that kind of nonsense we did before. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do this little line right here. We're going to say, you know, that, that, that message that we were building in the last program, it's going to be sitting in here. And we're going to pass it into a function, a Python function called encode. And we're going to tell Python, when, when you, we pass in this value into encode, I want you to use rot13. So any letter that comes into you, I want you to move it down 13 places and then put the output here, right? And he's going to go through every single character, shift it down 13, there. Next one, shift it down 13, right next to it. On and on and on, right? So let's run that. So let's do, you know, 1 dot... 2.3.4. Let's do Vince. Let's do, I don't know, password. Uh, it's asking me, do I want to, the same thing we saw last time. Do you want to write it to directory? Do you want to keep it in a file called file.txt? Say yes. Um, now it should have, should have written that out there. We'll look at that in a minute. Let's just continue. Let's do, you know, 5.6.7.8. Um, you know, I don't know, Mary and pass, uh, do file, hit enter, and then we'll exit out of the program. Now let's go look at that file. Um, let's bring this up. There's my file. And there we go. There's, um, there's the quote unquote encrypted encrypted stuff that we just typed in, Vince and Mary and passwords. Now, what's wrong with this? What, this is supposed to be like a, an encrypted message, right? What do we have here that makes this incredibly bad to use as a security tool? You have a pattern, right? You've got this pattern. Obviously, you know, these numbers are clear text. They haven't been encrypted, so I know that looks like a TCP IP address to me, right? And I know that these must be words, right? So if I see enough of these, I'm going to start to see repetition. I'm going to be able to count the, the length of the letters, right? And I'm going to see repeating letters within that. So I'm going to know, hey, you know, that's uh, anybody ever uh, read about the war stories? How they broke the, uh, what was it, the purple cipher? The Japanese purple, purple cipher. So they, they literally, they had a, they couldn't, the Americans could not break this code. It was super sophisticated code. But they only got one piece of it. And what they did was, uh, they thought they knew what it was, what, what the rest of this message was. And they said, you know what? Uh, we think it's going to be an attack at this island. Call the commandant at the island and tell him, your water condition or your water filtration system is broken down, send us a new one. And sure enough, it got intercepted and encrypted, and they saw that that pattern developed, and it let them, it was kind of the Rosetta Stone for backtracking all the way through the cipher. So the point there is patterns are a disaster in, in any kind of security, right? 
Everybody, everybody get that? Feedback time. Good, bad, thumbs. All right. Continue on. Okay. All right. So now that we've got it, quote unquote, encrypted, we have to decrypt it, right? And we're going to use this, you know, rot is a perfect name for this cipher because it's terrible. So we're going to decrypt it. And guess what? And just open it using, I keep thinking this is Windows. And guess what? Come on. There it is. Uh, decrypt. Guess what? Just as easy it was to encrypt it, it's just as easy to decrypt it. You can go through this stuff, this listing later, but basically, uh, where are we? Here. Um, we say decode. Are you, this is our entry, right? Our name and our password that we're, you know, we're going to get a piece. We're going to read in that file. We're going to decode it and we're going to output it using, instead of encrypt, we're going to use decrypt, right? So just another term. Let's run this. Let me shut down some of these guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got to look at what you're doing. All right, uh, so we're going to use the default. Enter file name, file text. And there it is. So, I'm sorry, the, uh, the screen was behind the program. <laughs> so, we ran it. It came in. It said, gave us all the mumbo jumbo about the directory. Uh, it said, hey, I found, when I opened the file up and I found the jumbled stuff, I found two entries. Uh, and here's what they look like. Mumbo jumbo. I'm going to run it, instead of encrypting, I'm going to run this decrypting. And this is what it looks like. So we can do our next one. Which was Mary, yeah, okay. Everybody get it? What do you guys think? Yes. I got a question. <laughs> Sorry? The function, uh, like uh, decrypt or uh, encrypt, is it written in, in Python 2 or is it just internally uh, hard coded? That is an awesome question. That's a great question. Um, so Python is really a phony language so to speak. It's, it's really under the guts. What it, was, what it was designed to do was to be as simple as you could possibly get for a language. So what, this, what these guys did was take the C language, which is like one step above assembly language, they took that and they put all this stuff over the top of it that lets you use like English-like statements and all that kind of stuff. So the answer to your question is, everything that goes, remember I said, you know, you take in these source statements and, you know, something magical happens, it turns it into machine language. That's what's happening. Python is really like window dressing. It's like a sausage factory. You don't want to look, <laughs> you want to know what goes on, you know, inside that factory, right? You just want to eat it, right? So Python really disguises all that stuff. Make sense? Is that it? All right, well, I'm going to continue, because we're, continuing on. I'm going to continue on. You guys were probably going to leave anyway. <laughs> so you're, you're welcome to stay. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. Is this okay? Is it too slow, too fast? It's okay? Show of hands. Slow? Quickly raise them if it's too fast. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right, so let's just exit out. All right, so where are we? So we got encryption and bad decryption. Let's talk about what we know and love, network communications, right? So we got these operating systems. Yes, uh, question?
Uh, a general question. Uh, you are using Python 2.7? Yes. And uh, why you use 2.7 and not 3.5, for example? Great question. Are there any prizes to give out? So, <laughs> so that is a great question. Why this older version of Python, this, this 2.7? So a um, couple years ago, there was this big schism in the Python community, right? Uh, somebody woke up one morning and decided, you know what? We're going to create a new version of the language. And you know what? We're going to make it incompatible with the older version of the language, right? So this whole kind of religious craziness started up around what is better, three or two, two seven. So the reason that I use two seven is a couple reasons. One, you guys will be able to get more examples Hands down, there are more YouTube videos, more example code, uh, you know, on and on and on with 2.7 because it's legacy. It's been around, you know, long than 3. The second reason is the differences between them are not that vast. And in fact, I'm, in fact, I would argue that the 3.0 community, the 3x community, um, you know, everybody like, it went over like a lead balloon when they said no backward compatibility. So for the last couple of years, they've been building backward compatibility into the language. So uh, a lot of the stuff that you can do in three, you can also do in two. Now that being said, you're absolutely right. Three is the future of Python. Two seven is going to die. But they, they came out awesome. <laughs> they came out and said that, look, there's so many people that are using it uh, that, are, that are using 2.7, we can't throw it away. So it's going to stay on track. There's going to be no new, there's going to be no 2.8. There's going to be no new uh, changes to it. But uh, they're going to give it till like 2020. So get off the schneid by 2020 or, you know, whatever. And again, they've been building in so much backward compatibility that it's, it's very easy to overcome. And in fact, I would say that's hurting the three community because if you can do everything you used to do in two, and you can't do everything you can with three, you know, you get it. So we talk about network communications, right? We are all about that. We live, sleep, eat, breathe network communications, right? Moving packets and frames across a network. But we, you know, don't really consider a lot of times once that frame hits that NIC card, you know, we're out of here. That job, our job is done, right? So the applications programmer looks at it and says, you know what, I did my, I issued my write command in whatever language it is, or I opened my file and closed it, so I'm out of here, right? Usually there's not a lot of consideration for what goes on from the NIC card up, right? I, I would say that the networking community is more aware of that than probably a lot of the programming community, right? So let's look at that. Um, this is, you know, my bad example of a communication stack. We all know what a communication stack is, right? So <clears throat> in this case, you know, we got a bunch of hardware, you know, we're, at the end of the day, we're clocking bits in and off a wire, putting them in buffers, a whole bunch of low levels. This is where you would see C and assembly, right, uh, going on. And then there's our, you know, beloved OSI model, IP, you know, TCP, UDP, broken up into different capabilities, right? And usually the way that you access one or the other is through something called a port, right? And then you have higher level protocols like HTTP and HTTPS, right? At the end of the day, they really don't do a lot. Now, I, that's, that's not fair. They do a lot of formatting. They do a lot of uh, encryption. They do a lot of stuff under the covers. But at the end of the day, the thing that gets the communication stuff moving is the socket interface. And that's what we're kind of going to get wrapped around here. Everybody get this picture? So what I, I'd like to do in this, you know, what the time remaining is, you know, start out here, go to here, move up to here, then get to here, then here, and here. But you guys get that? 
And if not, I promise, anything we don't finish, I will uh, be making videos and adding to the repository. So, you know, again, this won't be uh, the last time you see this, I hope. So, let's talk about out of the box, what can you get, uh, you know, from your, your NIC card? What can you get from your information from, you get from the communication stack? So we'll look at a couple of things. We'll look at using the socket uh, library without doing anything, sending any information. We'll look at uh, maybe building a little port scanner, right? A cheap El Cheapo port scanner. We'll look at some of the protocol stacks themselves that are on the machine. And then we'll do this simple El Cheapo UDP client server uh, connection, right? And then we'll finish that up with this, what we call a countdown server. Just, you know, a server, a client, server sends out the message. Again, if you guys get this, these listings running, you probably can pick up these messages uh, when I send them out. So, all right. So, I won't get into this. Let me see if, I, yeah, okay. Whole bunch of things that, just like when you do a DIR, when you take a directory, what are you doing? You're, you're executing a program that's part of the operating system that says, hey, uh, operating system, go in to, the, to your uh, file system and pull out information and display it for me, right? So that's called DIR or LS if you're a Linux, Linux person. Uh, well, there are similar functionality in the socket library. There are little programs that you can execute that will go in, look into the stack, and tell you, you know, what IP address is there, how many IP addresses are on this machine, what's the machine's name, on and on and on. And this is just basically, I literally cut and paste this out of the Python library, right? Now, all languages have the ability to do this. They have some kind of modular or library that allows you to do this. Um, they may call it something different, right? Uh, they may access it a little bit differently, but they all essentially work the same way. Uh, so let's, let's run this. Let's run one or two. Uh, hold on. Let's bring up our VM. What's the password? Huh? Vagrant. Vagrant. Vagrant for the Vagrant VM. All right, so let's uh, open up. Where are we? What were you looking for? What was it? I think I'm on my presentation again. We want to look at our, oh, examples, right? Yeah, socket examples. So we want to see what is, um, we want to see what you can do just out of the box without having to set up a connection or sending packets over the wire, just what information can you pull out of your, your communication stack? So I just assembled a bunch of the more common ones, right? Um, there's a way, this is a way you test to see if there's an IPv6 stack on the system, right? Uh, it will come back, if you say, hey, socket, is there an IPv6? It'll come back true if there is, false if there's not. We all know you can have more than one communication stack, right? Like you can have IPv4, V6, you can have DECnet, you know, Apple Talk, SNA, on and on and on, right? So um, when we do a get, this is an important one, we do a get host name, we're querying our particular stack, this is an IPv4 thing, it's going to say, it's going to return my machine name, wherever I execute this one, right? I'm going to put that in the host name and I'm going to print it out. This machine's name is host name. It's also, if I say get an FQDN, what do you think that does? Gets a fully qualified domain name, right? So we do the same thing. We'll plug that into this variable and we say, this machine's fully qualified domain name is blank. Then these ones only work with IPv4, right? So uh, what we'll do is get host by name, I'll show you what that, we'll actually show you what that does. We'll cheat. It gives you an IP address, <laughs> okay? Um, we can get extended information on that, that communication stack. 
We can, uh, let's see. Well, let's just run it. Question. You are working with uh, module socket. Okay. Inside the library are now a lot of functions. Is there a possibility to list all the functions? Give him two of those. That was a great question. That was outstanding. Let me, let me actually show you. That's a great question. Hold on one second. Uh, let's take a little left turn here. We'll execute the shell. I mean, this is, this is really significant. I mean, that's a great point. Import socket. Now, what I just did there was I went out in the built-in libraries in Python, and you can go in. Python's an open architected language. You can go in and pull up the socket library and look at all the stuff inside it. But you can also do this. EIR, parentheses, socket. And there you go. There's all the, <laughs> there's a quiz after this. <laughs> no, actually, it's not bad. It's not bad. Like, uh, this stuff, this is all the stuff I was just babbling about, right? Get host name, get name info. These are the names of the functions inside that library. Up here, uh, you'll see all the defaults. Let's see if we can go up. If we can go up, uh, go up a little bit. Yeah, here's all the default variables that you can have, right? So, you know, whatever this is, this, is a, this translates into a number. It's somewhere deep down in that library is a, a variable called IP proto IPv6, and it's got a number assigned to it, right? So, that, great question. That is the way you kind of break, you can break down any module, not just a socket, right? Import it, do a DIR, and it'll dump out, look, these are all the utilities, that, the methods they're called, and all the attributes or the variables that I have associated with them. And then you gotta kinda pick your way through them. Does that make sense? It's a great, great question. All right, so let's just run this thing. Socket examples. So, <clears throat> what we came away with was, you saw the first thing, right? We said, so this host does support an IPv6. We had that first, you know, has an IPv6. We got the uh, host name, right, from the, the stack. We got its fully qualified domain name. We got its IPv4 address. And then we got, like, this extended information. Like, what if I have more than one NIC card? One IP address, not NIC card. It's not, it doesn't tie to a NIC card. It actually ties to an IP address. In this case, I've got two. I've got two IP addresses, right? Um, you know, if, if this machine has an alias, any kind of an alias, uh, it will show up here. Tells me how many addresses I have, blah, 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 right? Here's the got you. When you do this, when you start messing around with this, um, you're going to do something called a bind, a bind, where you want to say, hey, I want to send... I want to be a server, and I'm going to bind my program, my socket, to this IP stack. What Python will do, and what any language will do, is bind to the preferred IP address. Right? So your, your primary IP address is what it's going to bind to. If you, you might not want that to bind to that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, everybody see what I'm talking about? All right, let's, let's just move on here real quick. So let's, um, we've got the information about this machine, this virtual machine. Let's look at, uh, what's, what's Cisco up to? www.cisco.com. Okay, so we went out, we did a query. He did, said, uh, give me a fully qualified domain name to locate cisco.com. Did a DNS, he didn't know where that was, did a DNS query for it, came back and said, okay, here's his address. All right, so now let's uh, plug that address in. Uh, what is it, 104, <laughs> I hate these glasses, dot uh, 122 dot 84 dot 150. 
There you go. Guess what? Points to a CDN, an Akamai uh, CDN. Everybody see that? That's, um, that's what we can identify. Now, there's more stuff. Clearly, Cisco has more than one IP address. <laughs> it's got two. We splurged. Um, it's clearly, it's got more. But that's what we can, that's as far as we can get. What you'd have to start doing is a bunch of who is is and you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Everybody get that? Useful, not useful, throw it away, thumbs up. Okay, all right, where are we now? We, uh, okay, so we got the basic information. Let's do a uh, port scan. Let's do a scan real quick. Let me open this thing up. Part one, uh, what did I call that? Socket, socket scan? That's, all right, yeah, let's start it at, uh, here we're gonna start, we're gonna have a loop where we're gonna start at port um, 52. We have a range, this is an IP function, a, a, a Python function that says, hey, you know, take, a, a range of numbers from the number 52 to 500, take the number 52 and put it in there, and then do this stuff. And then when you've done that stuff, come back and get number 53, put it in there, and do that stuff. Get 54, 55, all the way to 500, right? So what I'm saying here is, I'm gonna start at, I don't know, I just picked a number out of the air, uh, you know, TCP port 52. I'm gonna go to port 500, okay? Let's see what happens. So let's run IP address 10.0.2.25. I think that was 2. So he's searching. What he's doing is he's going in um, and he's trying to connect to the service that we just defined. Right? So he's going to go in and he's going to try to connect to TCP address, uh, you know, 10.0.2.15 colon 52. And when he tries to connect to that, it's going to fail. Yes. Sorry? Sorry. Oh, okay. So that was just the advanced error correction. <laughs> it's called fat finger. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out and making me look like an idiot. <laughs> All right, let's see. <laughs> Good one. All right. This time we'll use 15. <laughs> 10 dot zero dot. 2.15, much better. <laughs> so I was wondering why it was going so slow. So it goes out, starts at 52, and tries to connect to port 52. Tries to connect to 10.0.215 colon 52. It fails, it blows up. But the way that we have the, the statement, it says, hey look, go connect, if you can't, if it blows up, then, then just you know, print a plus sign, right? Everybody see that? Then it goes on and says, okay, I'm back into that loop, go get 53, 54, 55, 56. Everybody see that? So something to fool around with. Oh, we got a lot of programs open. What do you guys think? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, is this what you were thinking, what you were looking for? I'm just shutting some programs down. Is anybody uh, trying it? Did anybody get any of the code? Okay. I'm going to make you stay after, after school. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's just look at the sock. I just wanted to say, uh, someone asked me about the box repository and they didn't know where it was. Uh, do you have an address for that? Absolutely. It, um, 
Is it's, it in the? Is it in the? Um, hold on one second. Okay. And I'm sorry, I should have uh, actually embedded it in every one of these slides. Um, where's that file? Part one repository. Edit with idle. So uh, we open up a web browser. Uh, it's going to go to this URL. We're going we're to uh, build a just a, a variable, a URL, and then we're going to execute a Python uh, utility called from web browser module called open. You know, co open whatever's there. Right? Everybody see that? Yeah, actually, um, I don't, <laughs> I was wondering, I was getting kind of like nervous. I, I put up a blog uh, like two weeks ago and I, I started babbling about, you know, all the libraries and the videos and stuff. It's on the Cisco blog. And I was wondering, I was going to ask, did anybody read my blog? <laughs> it's, the first one. it's the first one I did. Uh, so I, didn't, I heard like crickets when it went out there. But if you go to our blog, our Cisco blog, that's one, one way you can get it, is go to our blog, look up Vince Kelly, V. Kelly. You'll see DevNet 10 you know, 40, 1041, 1042. I will tell you, you'll, if, you're, if you can't sleep, just read what I wrote there. It's got all the links to the repositories, a whole write-up and all that kind of stuff. Here's the other way. Um, did everybody get this, this link? Can we write it down, maybe? Yeah, we can. Uh, I'll put it into the uh, DevNet Twitter page, I guess, or maybe a, a Spark Room if I can. Uh, uh, or we can write it down and put it <laughs> the old-fashioned way, using low tech. Um, all right, so uh, let's just look at the stack real quick, some of the information we can pull out. Again, the, the point here is just as much, just as you can get a whole bunch of detail, granular detail around the files on your system, uh, you know, about what you know, network adapter you're using or, or video adapter you're using, you can get a lot from the uh, communication stack that you're using as well. So let's just, and then we'll jump into the UDP thing and we'll, uh, what are we looking at next? Uh, socket protocols, right? Uh, let me go to the machine. Let me go here. Python. Let me open up. Uh, we're doing... Part one. Examples. Socket protocols. All right, here, all we're going to do is just dump out a whole bunch of stuff on the stack. And I'll show you that, that we get from the stack. We'll just run it. And then we'll move on. So we just went in, we queried the stack. And what, what it told us was, you know, we can see a bunch of things. You can see you know, we've got more than one address. And oh, by the way, um, you know, some of it, some of those addresses are being used for IPv6. Some are being IPv4. Some of them are being, using, being used for IPv4 TCP. Some are being used for IPv4 <laughs> UDP, right? And that's the family, the address family INET means IPv4. Uh, let's see if we have a six in here. I can go up a little bit, but uh, I think uh, 17, yeah. SOC DGRAM means datagram. And what, what is datagram? UDP, right? So the socket datagram, uh, socket stream is TCP, right? Protocol number six. Here's the socket address, right? Everybody see that? So there's a whole lot of good stuff while you're trying to figure this out. Go in, fool around with it, monkey around with it, you know, see what you can make out of it. All right, so let's get into the UDP stuff. Uh, let me start up. Let me shut down some of these uh, listings. Okay. One more. And nobody has this running, right? 
So what I'll do is, let me, let me do this. I'll run, I'll run a server on my VM, on the VM, and then I'll, I'll drop to uh, Windows and run a client. Okay? Unless somebody wants to participate as well. Uh, where's the UDP stuff? Come on. Open a file. I'll just go into... Uh, I mean, part one. Anybody see UDP? Let me do this. Let me find it. Scan. Ah, it's not in the library, that's why. Go back up. Let me go to, I'll just go into uh, our UDP. And again, this is under, if you go to the repository, this is under the listings, under the topic listings. All right, so let's bring up, uh, let's bring up server. File. Ah, I want to go up one. Hold on. Almost there. There's UDP. Faster. Nah, that's not the one I want. Sorry, I'm not the fastest of foot here. I'll open. All right. This time we'll do it. Okay. Client, server. There we go. Finally, all right. This is a massive amount of code. This is huge, beyond huge. All we're doing is we're importing the socket library, the socket module. It does all the work for us. So what we're doing is we're setting up, and this is just an option. This second line you can pretty much forget about. But here, and we're going to talk about this in the, the presentation, um, we're telling the socket what address family we're going to use, IPv4. We're telling it we want to use a datagram service, right? And once we get through that, we want to spin up, and we'll talk about this in a minute, spin up a socket object. Then we want to say, hey, you know what? I, uh, I want to use port 5678. I don't know. I feel lucky. It's my lottery number. So we, we just make this arbitrary uh, number. We pick it out of the air. And it's an integer, right? And then we say, hey, I just want to broadcast. This is normally when you, you send, uh, when we transmit, it, we're either a server or a client. We have to give it two things. We have to give it an address and a port number. Well, if we're using a datagram service, we can use all Fs, right? We can use just a broadcast. So I don't have to plug an address in here, right? This will just blast it out. To, this is what blasts everything out. We come into here, we go into this infinite loop, we say, put this hello world in this message, and then execute this function deep down in that, that library that you saw. This is one of the methods. Send the message to this destination, you know, that's being taken care of by that socket, right? Everybody get that? Let's run it. So it's just sitting out there. If anybody's got this running, you can pick up, you should be able to pick this up now. And this is where, make me a liar. I'll go to, to uh, Windows and I'll run a client. And let me, let me just run through the client. You know, for UDP, it's about the simplest thing you can do. The client is just as easy. Um, I'm going to issue, in this case, I've decided to issue tie, tie uh, this program to this port. I'm not going to use an address, but I'm going to lock that client into that port number. And I'm going to say, hey, anything that comes in on that port, I want you to dump it out here and give me the IP address of the, the uh, person that sent it. So let's just run this. Oh, you know what?
Got to love firewalls, man. <laughs> Wonder if I time down on this side. Let me rerun it. Socket address, never protocol is permitted. Let me do this. Let me just see. Find string, uh, what would you call it? Five, six, seven, eight. There's somebody listening on 5678, so let me kill that. Yes, kill. Uh, he's process number 388. Let me do that again. And let's see if this works. Make me a liar here. If not, I'm just going to take this out. For the life of me, I don't know what is doing that. Um, let me do this. Try running it on the local machine. <clears throat> uh, Python. File open. Let me go to UDP. Client. Let me start shutting down. Any questions? Good. <laughs> How not to do a demo? I wonder if I'm uh, spinning these up. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, it actually ran. <laughs> I keep, it keeps dropping behind the screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, it actually, this one ran. Um, it came back with 10.215. It was to, to the same adapter. Uh, let's, let's, I don't know what happened there. Let me shut all these down. So any questions? What do you guys think? Besides I have a quick one. I, have a quick one. Um, I can write your blog thing on the wall here. It's, it's blogs.cisco.com slash vkelly. Is that right? Or uh, that, um, that URL uh, in this. Right here, uh, let me, sorry about this. Uh, part one, it's right here. This URL? Cisco.box. Devon at 40 getting started. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Trying on this. So, um, one ninety two dot one sixty eight dot fifty six dot one oh one. Aha. All right, so what I'm trying to do now is my Ubuntu server is on, um, 
I, I have my VM connected to an internal network that uh, my Ethernet adapter, it's host mode. You guys are aware of host adapter on VirtualBox? It just makes a, a, an address, right? So um, all I'm trying to do is to make sure that I can get out, I can even get out the door here. Ping. U2.168.56.1. I can get through. My firewall's all right. Firewall's off. Let's do this. Let's just run a different program. Let's do our countdown server. All right, so this is just going to take a bunch of date and times. I'm not even going to go through the date and time routines, but it's essentially going to do the same thing. It's going to broadcast out. Um, it's going to broadcast out on a uh, this host port. After I enter the IP address for this server, it's going to bind to that host, and then it's just going to start broadcasting messages. All right, so. 192.168.56.1. That's the internal IP address for, um, for the Windows machine. So there, it's sending out a bunch of messages. I don't know if you can figure that out. What do you think this is? ROP13, right? We can already see that it started probably start seeing patterns with that, right? Let me see if I can uh, run it now and run the other guy on this host. File open. Uh, client decoded. Yeah. All right, there you go. So on the Windows side, I encrypted the stream, the message stream, in uh, ROT13. Uh, and you can see it's kind of dangerous, right? I mean, look at the patterns that are forming here. We can start to break these down, right? I know there's some kind of incremental thing going on here. If you look on the client side, uh, this is like a joke. It was supposed to be anybody American football? Fans here? No? It's a countdown to how many days, months, weeks, hours, minutes, seconds until the Eagles, Philadelphia Eagles, kick off against the. Uh... No? No football fans? Should have been soccer. <laughs> so um, I don't know why that other one failed. That, that's kind of weird. Uh, if you guys, you should be able to pick this up now if you. If anybody wants, is running this, no? All right. All right, moving right along after that successful demo. Let's see where we are. Any questions? What do you guys think? Is this what you were expecting, not expecting, good, bad, indifferent? Uh, other, than the, other than the failed <laughs> debacle with the... Uh, <laughs> All right, so let's talk about sockets. We've been babbling about sockets. What are they? Really, uh, you guys know this. this. We run up against this in IP every day, right? Socket is nothing more than a number, right, that's glued together with an IP address, right? So if I want, you know, uh, mail, what is, what's the uh, socket number or the, the uh, port number for mail? 23? Is it 20, 25? So it's, yeah, so to, get a, so to get a message up that stack, so to get a message up that stack, we need to open up uh, a, a socket name, which is the IP address and that 25, and then any packet that's coming up, you guys know this is, this is networking, right? So that's, it's just a, a conceptual entity. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's just a, um, when you establish two sessions, one is going to have, uh, you know, a socket name. They're both going to have socket names. 
One is going to be of a particular socket number type, and the other one's going to have a different number, right? And, and we'll, we'll look at that, what that means, right, in a minute. I won't get into this. Uh, Object-oriented. You guys really want to know about object-oriented programming? What we're trying to do is stay away from object-oriented programming, because I don't think as network engineers we actually need it. I think uh, doing this stuff like the UDP uh, countdown client, countdown server, the one that actually worked, uh, that's where we're going to get involved, right? We're not going to build big, gigantic programs. But that being said, we have to have a sense for it. What happens in a communication session, right? Well, there's, there's five questions when you want to connect uh, or you want to send data across a network, right? One is, and we've already seen a lot of it, what kind of network, what kind of um, do we want to talk to? Do we want to talk IPv6, IPv4? You know, what are we doing? And that's where that, um, you know, address family INET comes in. If it's IPv6, it's going to be address family INET6, right? And again, to your point, somewhere buried in the bowels of the socket module is a literal, you know, that's associated with that variable name, IP, you know, AF underscore INET, right? So second question is, what kind of connection do we want? Do we want UDP or do we want a connection-oriented TCP? What kind of protocol do we need, right? Now, um, you know, let me hold off on that. What, what IP address to use and what TCP or UDP port number should we use? So, you know, when we answer like this kind of question, we want an IPv4 stack and we want UDP, well then we really don't need this question answered that often. So it's rare that you'll see this even come into play, right? We do have to know what IP address to use and what, what TCP or UDP port number we want to use, right? So let's step through it. We do the import, and what does that do? Import socket. What does import socket do? What is that? Import socket. It pulls in the socket module. Yep. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to basically fill out this questionnaire. Hey, I want IPv4 and I want TCP, right? And really all we're doing here is down in the bowels of that module, right? We're saying, hey, you know, go get these literals down in this, this, uh, this method here, this, this called socket. We'll, we'll break this down in a minute. So that's where we establish the type of stack that we want and the type of connection that we want. Uh, so we retrieve the, the Python socket and the module. We talk about the method. Now, we saw that when we did the DIR, right? We, the whole library, we did a DIR on socket, and then it showed us all the little methods or functions, for, for lack of a better term, underneath that. We say, what's the protocol stack? You know, what do we want, TCP or UDP? And then we spin up what's called spinning up a socket object. And this is as far as we're going to go in terms of object-oriented programming. But what does that mean exactly? Well, think of our program, the one that worked. <laughs> we, we import the socket module, right? We, um, we do this whole rigmarole where we identify the communication stack we want and the types of protocols. And then we spin up, right, where that C is, we literally, right, when this gets executed, this thing invokes or spins up an object, right? A socket object. Um, think of it this way. Everybody knows what a virtual machine is, right? So compare, if you compare a monolithic, you know, uh, IBM mainframe to a virtual machine, Virtual machine, you know, the IBM mainframe, you can go anywhere inside that thing, make any kind of manipulation or change you want, right? You can have 100 people working on that thing, VTAM system programmers, you know, uh, DB2 programmers, you know, COBOL programmers, if they're still around, um, all, all that kind of stuff. All at once, all hitting it from all angles. Virtual machine is completely compact. It takes care of everything. I can't go in while a virtual machine 
is running and say, you know, go into change BIOS while it's, while it's executing, right? It's completely contained. That's exactly what an object, a socket object does. It's an instantiation of a whole bunch of routines that take care of all the, the low damn minutia, sending packets and making sure they're framed correctly, you know, out of sequence, all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to worry about that at all. All you got, and the way that it gets instantiated is with this statement. So from now on, whenever you're going to talk out that, that NIC card or whatever to whatever machine, you're going you're gonna to reference this. And I just happen to call it the letter C. You could call it, you know, mumbly peg, whatever you want. It's, it's a name that refers to an object that gets spun up as a result of filling out that information, right? Everybody get that? So, well, it's basically what I already got done saying here. Set, you know, handle sending and receiving data, uh, setting up the session, tearing it down, right? Um, you know, making sure you're, out, you're in order, all that kind of stuff. All right, so then we do a connect, right? And notice what we're doing here. We're saying socket object, execute this method inside the socket. So there's a little method in here called connect that has a whole bunch of little subroutines in it that are responsible for, you know, sending out the, you know, the three-way handshake, balancing that thing out, right? Okay, so on the server side, what we do, we import the library. We, we basically fill out the same form, right? We spin up a server object. Right? In this case, uh, you know, this is just, I just threw this in here. I executed one of those utilities that would get the IP address of the server. But you don't have to do that. You can actually, instead of, the, instead of this, you can just, you know, type in a string, you know, 192.68.53. You know, whatever, right? But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because you're hard coding, hard coding that, which is a bad thing to do. So, we have our NIC card in the bottom, and what we'll do is we'll bind, we have bound, in this case, we're going to bind that IP address and this port number. By, by doing this, we're binding it to this NIC, this IP address that sits on that NIC. Right? We're gluing them together. So then we're going to issue something called a listen. And all the listen is for this socket, this server uh, object, a listen just sits there and listens. You guys have seen this a million times in the network. When you, you do a sniffer or whatever, you'll see these ports are listening. That's literally what they're doing. They're sitting there with, yes. What's that? It is case sensitive. You're great, good, good call on that. Eagle eye, I was trying to get one by you. I was hoping you wouldn't notice that. Uh, typo on my part. So. A listen, what's going to do is it's going to do stuff, and then it's going to build a queue, basically a queue of like, and we're saying, hey, listen for up to five outstanding connection requests coming from anywhere, right, from a client, right? So it's going to sit there and it's going to accept up to five of them. And it gets to its sixth one, it's going to say, nope, can't, no can do. What's that? Good thought, hold that thought. Uh, let me, this just goes through the whole thing where we, we, uh, we do a connect. I think we do a connect. I'm reading this right. We send on that, that object. The packet goes out. He puts it in his connection table, right? So he's going he's to bind to this NIC card, this IP address. He's going to say, okay, in addition to that, I want you to accept up to five inbound connection requests. In the meantime, this guy comes in, and he, see, he goes into an infinite loop, and he says, hey, this socket, this socket object, will accept anybody coming in, right? This guy comes in, he says, oh, I got one. I got one from this guy's IP address, 192.168.1. whatever, and here's the socket that I'm going to, re my peer socket, that I'm going to refer to him from now on. Remember we said, 
there's, there's a socket name, which is the IP address and the, the port number on both sides. This is how he comes to understand, or it comes to understand, what that is, right? He gets a connection request, he accepts it, he takes the IP address and the socket, and he puts it up into a table. And that from that point on, he can reference that, and they can send messages back and forth. Does that make sense? Does it really? Does that make sense? All right. So uh, the point here is he builds that connection table. He builds, or it builds on its side, a socket object that represents that client. Right? And oh, by the way, over the course of a day, um, I can have a zillion of them. Right? I can have a zillion of these objects spun up. And this is where you get into all kinds of issues with performance tuning, right? Uh, a lot of the, the, the uh, uh, messages that we'll be sending, that we send, are completely dependent on things that have nothing to do with the IP address uh, stack. If I send out a TCP connection, for example, or I send out a, a TCP packet, and that NIC buffer is full, it's going to sit there. It's going to wait. Right? Uh, and it's going to go into the Van Jacobson, you know, slow down, out, all that nonsense, right? So when they come banging on your door that the network stinks, right? Just go tell them it's your, your NIC cards or, <laughs> or your socket connections or, you know, something. Baffle them with science. So I thought I had a description in here. Let's, let's break down one of these things. Um, here's the UDP server that blew up earlier. Uh, I thought I had a whole thing on bind. Let me see. Guess not. Oh, all right. So I, I'm sorry. To your question about a bind. All all a bind does is it's a routine that says you know from now on. Let's say um, I have I have three options. I have a couple of options actually. I can say bind to any, ad, any um, adapter that is in this machine. So if I have two NIC cards, and I don't specify the IP address, and I just specify a port, anything that comes in with that port, it's going to get, it's going to get listened to. I have the option of stipulating an IP address and a port number, right? In which case, anybody with that you know, uh, destination address or that source address with that, that uh, port number will get listened to, but it won't, right, it won't work on any other adapter. It'll be a specific to the adapter that that IP address is assigned to. And then I can do things like just, you know, in some cases, just broadcast a message, put all Fs in, you know, what have you. And that's where you get into, like uh, what we had talked about earlier, when you bind and you say, hey, just give me anybody, I don't care, bind to any address, just listen on this port number, you've got to be kind of aware of what that operating system is, is making a decision for you what NIC card he's going to attach you to, right? So, you know, if you get attached to an internal address that has, you know, that's natted somewhere, you're not going to get out, right? So just a, you know, just a... All right, so moving right along. Is this okay? Guys, uh, how about some feedback? More than just thumbs up or thumbs down. What, what, um, what questions can we answer? A free gift for anybody who asks some questions. <laughs> I think that thing's broken. Ah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. So, YangDK is also supporting C++. So yeah, uh, that's a great question. And you know, it's it's kind of like uh, you know, like religious thing. You know, a question you never ask. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so what's the difference? The question was, what's the difference between, say, C++ and Python? Well, hands down, flat out, 
C++ is going to be faster because it's a compiled language, right? So it's going to take all those statements, you know, gobble them up, you know, apply the rules, say, oh, this is broken. I'm not going to, I came across a syntax error. I'm not going to generate, I'm not going to let you proceed any further until you fix that, right? Very stubborn. Uh, but as a result of that, you get this error-free code that gets compiled and then linked in with these libraries, right? Um, and then you, you become this, you become part of the operating system, right? An executable. Whereas Python, there's already an executable program running, and it's taking in these statements, you know, as it goes. It's taking in a statement, and it's doing something with it. Right, so it's interpreted. That's what they mean by interpreted. Um, and it's generating this, like, temporary file that, that literally gets glued into something called a, a Python virtual machine. And it's not the virtual machine that we know and love. It's, you know, uh, it's like a... It's, it's just this other stuff. But the point is, when you have errors, the bad news is, when you have errors with Python, um, you can have situations where, unless you put error codes, like you saw my, my thing go haywire very quickly, right? Unless you put uh, like extensive error correction, you know, you take into account a whole lot of stuff, it will blow up on the fly. It'll blow up right there while it's executing. Compile program, it can happen, but it's, it's not as frequent, it's not as common, because there's so much syntactic uh, checking that's done beforehand, if that makes sense. Did that answer? So, I mean, there are all kinds of, like, Java lovers, C, uh, C++, you know, .NET people, crazy about, you know, C Sharp, and uh, they all have their pros and cons. I, I would say, though, hands down, um, it's, a, uh, it's an extremely powerful language, even if it is uh, interpreted. It comes with a whole bunch of stuff. It comes with its own web server, its own servers. Uh, just Let's move along. Let's jump into some of this.